Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of Homage to Catalonia by George Orwell, narrated by Patrick Tull. This book, copyrighted 1952 by Sonia Brownell Orwell, is recorded by permission of the estate of Mrs. Sonia Brownell Orwell. This performance is copyrighted 1989 by Recorded Books Incorporated. On April 14, 1931, Spain was declared a republic after hundreds of years of monarchy and several years of dictatorships. The provisional government arranged for elections in June, which created a parliament, or Cortes as it was called, composed of socialists, right-wing republicans, and a moderate left-wing alliance that seemed to win the most seats. For five years, plagued by strikes and revolts, the republic hung on, ratifying a constitution, confiscating church property, creating secular schools, and trying to implement some sort of land reform. But delay in the land question, the anti-church measures, and also the government's handling of the revolts and demonstrations began to erode the government's popular support. The center's control was weakening, and the extremists, both left and right, were becoming more powerful and more insistent. In July 1936, General Francisco Franco led a revolt backed by the army, a revolt that soon blossomed into full-scale civil war. Foreign intervention in this confrontation seems to have begun right away. By August 1936, Russian workers had begun to send money to the Loyalist forces, which were made up of Marxists, Communists, Socialists, and Anarchists, gathered under a loose coalition to fight for the Republic. By spring, Italian and German troops and planes were in action to support Franco's forces. The Nationalists' International Brigade of left-wing partisans, made up of volunteers from many countries, including England, France, and the United States, came to Spain to join the Loyalists. In 1937, Orwell went to Spain as a reporter and remained there as a private in one of these Loyalist regiments, called the Pum which was the abbreviation for the Partido Obrero de Unificación Marxista, the Party of Marxist Unification. He remained there for several months, and the following year, in 1938, he published Homage to Catalonia. There is a quotation from Proverbs 26, verses 5 and 6, which reads, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Chapter 1 In the Lenin barracks in Barcelona, the day before I joined the militia, I saw an Italian militiaman standing in front of the officer's table. He was a tough-looking youth of twenty-five or six, with reddish-yellow hair and powerful shoulders. His peaked leather cap was pulled fiercely over one eye. He was standing in profile to me, his chin on his breast, gazing with a puzzled frown at a map which one of the officers had open on the table. Something in his face deeply moved me. It was the face of a man who would commit murder and throw away his life for a friend, the kind of face you would expect in an anarchist, though as likely as not he was a communist. There were both candor and ferocity in it, also the pathetic reverence that illiterate people have for their supposed superiors. Obviously he could not make head or tail of the map. Obviously he regarded map-reading as a stupendous intellectual feat. I hardly know why, but I have seldom seen anyone, any man, I mean, to whom I have taken such an immediate liking. While they were talking round the table, some remark brought it out that I was a foreigner. The Italian raised his head and said quickly, Italiano? I answered in my bad Spanish, No, Ingles. E tu? Italiano. As we went out, he stepped across the room and gripped my hand very hard. Queer the affection you can feel for a stranger. It was as though his spirit and mine had momentarily succeeded in bridging the gulf of language and tradition and meeting in utter intimacy. I hope he liked me as well as I liked him, but I also knew that to retain my first impression of him I must not see him again, and needless to say I never did see him again. One was always making contacts of that kind in Spain, 
I mention this Italian militiaman because he is stuck vividly in my memory. With his shabby uniform and fierce, pathetic face, he typifies for me the special atmosphere of that time. He is bound up with all my memories of that period of the war. The red flags in Barcelona, the gaunt trains full of shabby soldiers creeping to the front, the grey, war-stricken towns farther up the line, the muddy, ice-cold trenches in the mountains. This was in late December 1936, less than seven months ago as I write, and yet it is a period that has already receded into enormous distance. Later events have obliterated it much more completely than they have obliterated 1935, or 1905 for that matter. I had come to Spain with some notion of writing newspaper articles, but I had joined the militia almost immediately, because at that time, and in that atmosphere, it seemed the only conceivable thing to do. The anarchists were still in virtual control of Catalonia, and the revolution was still in full swing. To anyone who had been there since the beginning, it probably seemed, even in December or January, that the revolutionary period was ending. But when one came straight from England, the aspect of Barcelona was something startling and overwhelming. It was the first time that I had ever been in a town where the working class was in the saddle. Practically every building of any size had been seized by the workers and was draped with red flags or with the red and black flag of the anarchists. Every wall was scrawled with the hammer and sickle and with the initials of the revolutionary parties. Almost every church had been gutted and its images burnt. Churches here and there were being systematically demolished by gangs of workmen. Every shop and cafe had an inscription saying that it had been collectivized. Even the boot blacks had been collectivized and their boxes painted red and black. Waiters and shop walkers looked you in the face and treated you as an equal. Servile and even ceremonial forms of speech had temporarily disappeared. Nobody said senor, or don, or even usted. Everyone called everyone else comrade and thou, and said salud instead of buenos dias. Tipping had been forbidden by law since the time of Primo de Rivera. Almost my first experience was receiving a lecture from an hotel manager for trying to tip a lift boy. There were no private motor cars, they had all been commandeered, and all the trams and taxis and much of the other transport was painted red and black. The revolutionary posters were everywhere, flaming from the walls in clean reds and blues that made the few remaining advertisements look like daubs of mud. Down the Ramblas, the wide central artery of the town, where crowds of people streamed constantly to and fro, the loudspeakers were bellowing revolutionary songs all day and far into the night, and it was the aspect of the crowds that was the queerest thing of all. In outward appearance, it was a town in which the wealthy classes had practically ceased to exist. Except for a small number of women and foreigners, there were no well-dressed people at all. Practically everyone wore rough working-class clothes or blue overalls or some variant of the militia uniform. All this was queer and moving. There was much in it that I did not understand. In some ways, I didn't even like it. But I recognized it immediately as a state of affairs worth fighting for. Also, I believed that things were as they appeared, that this was really a workers' state, and that the entire bourgeoisie had either fled, been killed, or voluntarily come over to the workers' side. I did not realize that great numbers of well-to-do bourgeois were simply lying low and disguising themselves as proletarians for the time being. Together with all this, there was something of the evil atmosphere of war. The town had a gaunt, untidy look. Roads and buildings were in poor repair. The streets at night were dimly lit for fear of air raids. The shops were mostly shabby and half empty. Meat was scarce and milk practically unobtainable. There was a shortage of coal, sugar and petrol, and a really serious shortage of bread. Even at this period, the bread queues were often hundreds of yards long. Yet so far as one could judge, the people were contented and hopeful. There was no unemployment, and the price of living was still extremely low. You saw very few conspicuously destitute people, and no beggars except the gypsies. Above all, there was a belief in the revolution and the future, a feeling of having suddenly emerged into an era of equality and freedom. Human beings were trying to behave as human beings, and not as cogs in the capitalist machine. In the barber shops were anarchist notices, 
The barbers were mostly anarchists, solemnly explaining that barbers were no longer slaves. In the streets were coloured posters appealing to prostitutes to stop being prostitutes. To anyone from the hard-boiled, sneering civilization of the English-speaking races, there was something rather pathetic in the literalness with which these idealistic Spaniards took the hackneyed phrases of revolution. At that time, revolutionary ballads of the naivest kind, all about proletarian brotherhood and the wickedness of Mussolini, were being sold on the streets for a few centimes each. I have often seen an illiterate militiaman buy one of these ballads, laboriously spell out the words, and then, when he had got the hang of it, begin singing it to an appropriate tune. All this time, I was at the Lenin barracks, ostensibly in training for the front. When I joined the militia, I had been told that I should be sent to the front the next day, but in fact I had to wait while a fresh centurio was got ready. The workers' militias, hurriedly raised by the trade unions at the beginning of the war, had not yet been organised on an ordinary army basis. The units of command were the section, of about thirty men, the centuria, of about a hundred men, and the column, which in practice meant any large number of men. The Lenin barracks was a block of splendid stone buildings with a riding school and enormous cobbled courtyards. It had been a cavalry barracks and had been captured during the July fighting. My centurion slept in one of the stables, under the stone mangers where the names of the cavalry chargers were still inscribed. All the horses had been seized and sent to the front, but the whole place still smelt of horse piss and rotten oats. I was at the barracks about a week. Chiefly I remember the horsey smells, the quavering bugle calls. All our buglers were amateurs. I first learned the Spanish bugle calls by listening to them outside the fascist lines. The tramp-tramp of hobnailed boots in the barrack yard, the long morning parades in the wintry sunshine, the wild games of football fifty aside and the gravel riding school. There were perhaps a thousand men at the barracks, and a score or so of women, apart from the militiamen's wives who did the cooking. There were still women serving in the militias, though not very many. In the early battles they had fought side by side with the men as a matter of course. It is a thing that seems natural in time of revolution. Ideas were changing already, however. The militiamen had to be kept out of the riding school while the women were drilling there, because they laughed at the women and put them off. A few months earlier, no one would have seen anything comic in a woman handling a gun. The whole barracks was in a state of filth and chaos to which the militia reduced every building they occupied, and which seems to be one of the by-products of revolution. In every corner you came upon piles of smashed furniture, broken saddles, brass cavalry helmets, empty sabre scabbards, and decaying food. There was frightful wastage of food, especially bread. From my barrack room alone, a basket full of bread was thrown away at every meal, a disgraceful thing when the civilian population was short of it. We ate at long trestle tables out of permanently greasy tin pannikins and drank out of a dreadful thing called a porron. A porron is a sort of glass bottle with a pointed spout from which a thin jet of wine spurts out whenever you tip it up. You can thus drink from a distance without touching it with your lips, and it can be passed from hand to hand. I went on strike and demanded a drinking cup as soon as I saw a porron in use. To my eyes the things were altogether too like bed bottles, especially when they were filled with white wine. By degrees they were issuing the recruits with uniforms, and because this was Spain everything was issued piecemeal, so that it was never quite certain who had received what, and various of the things we most needed, such as belts and cartridge boxes, were not issued till the last moment, when the train was actually waiting to take us to the front. I've spoken of the militia uniform, which probably gives a wrong impression. It was not exactly a uniform. Perhaps a multiform would be the proper name for it. Everyone's clothes followed the same general plan, but they were never quite the same in any two cases. Practically everyone in the army wore corduroy knee breeches, but there the uniformity ended. Some wore puttees, others corduroy gaiters, others leather leggings or high boots. Everyone wore a zipper jacket, but some of the jackets were of leather, others of wool, and of every conceivable colour. The kinds of cap were about as numerous as their wearers. It was usual to adorn the front of your cap with a party badge, and in addition nearly every man wore a red or red and black handkerchief round his throat. A militia column at that time was an extraordinary-looking rabble, but the clothes had to be issued as this or that factory rushed them out, 
and they were not bad clothes considering the circumstances. The shirts and socks were wretched cotton things, however, quite useless against cold. I hate to think of what the militiamen must have gone through in the earlier months before anything was organised. I remember coming upon a newspaper of only about two months earlier, in which one of the POUM leaders, that is, the Party of Marxist Unification, Partido Obrero de Unificación Marxista, after a visit to the front, said that he would try to see to it that every militiaman had a blanket, a phrase to make you shudder if you ever slept in a trench. On my second day at the barracks, there began what was comically called instruction. At the beginning, there were frightful scenes of chaos. The recruits were mostly boys of sixteen or seventeen from the back streets of Barcelona, full of revolutionary ardour, but completely ignorant of the meaning of war. It was impossible even to get them to stand in line. Discipline did not exist. If a man disliked an order, he would step out of the ranks and argue fiercely with the officer. The lieutenant who instructed us was a stout, fresh-faced, pleasant young man, who had previously been a regular army officer and still looked like one, with his smart carriage and spick-and-span uniform. Curiously enough, he was a sincere and ardent socialist. Even more than the men themselves, he insisted upon complete social equality between all ranks. I remember his pained surprise when an ignorant recruit addressed him as Senor. What? Senor? Who is that calling me Senor? Are we not all comrades? I doubt whether it made his job any easier. Meanwhile, the raw recruits were getting no military training that could be of the slightest use to them. I had been told that foreigners were not obliged to attend instruction. The Spaniards, I noticed, had a pathetic belief that all foreigners knew more of military matters than themselves. But naturally, I turned out with the others. I was very anxious to learn how to use a machine gun. It was a weapon I had never had a chance to handle. To my dismay, I found that we were taught nothing about the use of weapons. The so-called instruction was simply parade ground drill of the most antiquated, stupid kind. Right turn, left turn, about turn, marching at attention in columns of threes, and all the rest of that useless nonsense which I'd learned when I was fifteen years old. It was an extraordinary form for the training of a guerrilla army to take. Obviously, if you have only a few days in which to train a soldier, you must teach him the things he will most need, how to take cover how to advance across open ground, how to mount guards and build a parapet, above all, how to use his weapons. Yet this mob of eager children, who were going to be thrown into the front line in a few days' time, were not even taught how to fire a rifle or pull the pin out of a bomb. At the time, I didn't grasp that this was because there were no weapons to be had. In the POUM militia, the shortage of rifles was so desperate that fresh troops reaching the front always had to take their rifles from the troops they relieved in the line. In the whole of the Lenin barracks, there were, I believe, no rifles except those used by the sentries. After a few days, though still a complete rabble by any ordinary standard, we were considered fit to be seen in public and in the mornings we were marched out to the public gardens on the hill behind the Plaza de España. This was the common drill ground of all the party militias, besides the Carabineros and the first contingents of the newly formed Popular Army. Up in the public gardens it was a strange and heartening sight. Down every path and alleyway, amid the formal flower beds, squads and companies of men marched stiffly to and fro, throwing out their chests and trying desperately to look like soldiers. All of them were unarmed, and none completely in uniform, though on most of them the militia uniform was breaking out in patches here and there. The procedure was always very much the same. For three hours we strutted to and fro. The Spanish marching step is very short and rapid. Then we halted, broke the ranks, and flopped thirstily to a little grocer's shop which was halfway down the hill, and was doing a roaring trade in cheap wine. Everyone was very friendly to me. As an Englishman, I was something of a curiosity, and the Carabinero offices made much of me and stood me drinks. Meanwhile, whenever I could get our lieutenant into a corner, I was clamouring to be instructed in the use of a machine gun. I used to drag my Hugo's dictionary out of my pocket and start on him in my villainous Spanish. Yo se manejar fusil. No se manejar a metralladora. Quiero aprender a metralladora. Cuando vamos a aprender a matralladora?
The answer was always a harassed smile and a promise that there should be machine gun instruction manana. Needless to say, manana never came. Several days passed, and the recruits learned to march in step and spring to attention almost smartly. But if they knew which end of a rifle the bullet came out of, that was all they knew. One day an armed carabinero strolled up to us when we were halting and allowed us to examine his rifle. It turned out that in the whole of my section no one except myself even knew how to load the rifle, much less how to take aim. All this time I was having the usual struggles with the Spanish language. Apart from myself, there was only one Englishman at the barracks, and nobody even among the officers spoke a word of French. Things were not made easier for me by the fact that when my companions spoke to one another, they generally spoke in Catalan. The only way I could get along was to carry everywhere a small dictionary which I whipped out of my pocket in moments of crisis. But I would sooner be a foreigner in Spain than in most countries. How easy it is to make friends in Spain. Within a day or two, there was a score of militiamen who called me by my Christian name, showed me the ropes, and overwhelmed me with hospitality. I'm not writing a book of propaganda, and I do not want to idealize the POUM militia. The whole militia system had serious faults, and the men themselves were a mixed lot, for by this time voluntary recruitment was falling off, and many of the best men were already at the front or dead. There was always among us a certain percentage who were completely useless. Boys of fifteen were being brought up for enlistment by their parents, quite openly for the sake of the ten pesetas a day which was the militiaman's wage, also for the sake of the bread which the militia received in plenty and could smuggle home to their parents. But I defy anyone to be thrown as I was among the Spanish working class. I ought perhaps to say the Catalan working class, for apart from a few Aragonese and Andalusians I mixed only with Catalans, and not be struck by their essential decency. Above all, their straightforwardness and generosity. A Spaniard's generosity, in the ordinary sense of the word, is at times almost embarrassing. If you ask him for a cigarette, he will force the whole packet upon you. And beyond this, there is generosity in a deeper sense, a real largeness of spirit, which I have met with again and again in the most unpromising circumstances. Some of the journalists and other foreigners who travelled in Spain during the war have declared that in secret the Spaniards were bitterly jealous of foreign aid. All I can say is that I never observed anything of the kind. I remember that a few days before I left the barracks, a group of men returned on leave from the front. They were talking excitedly about their experiences and were full of enthusiasm for some French troops who had been next to them at Huesca. The French were very brave, they said, adding enthusiastically, más valientes que nosotros, braver than we are. Of course, I demurred, whereupon they explained that the French knew more of the art of war, were more expert with bombs, machine guns, and so forth. Yet the remark was significant. An Englishman would cut his hand off sooner than say a thing like that. Every foreigner who served in the militia spent his first few weeks in learning to love the Spaniards and in being exasperated by certain of their characteristics. In the front line, my own exasperation sometimes reached the pitch of fury. The Spaniards are good at many things, but not at making war. All foreigners alike are appalled by their inefficiency. Above all, their maddening unpunctuality. The one Spanish word that no foreigner can avoid learning is manana. Tomorrow. Literally, the morning. Whenever it is conceivably possible, the business of today is put off until manana. This is so notorious that even the Spaniards themselves make jokes about it. In Spain, nothing, from a meal to a battle, ever happens at the appointed time. As a general rule, things happen too late. But just occasionally, just so that you shan't even be able to depend on their happening late, they happen too early. A train which is due to leave at eight will normally leave at any time between nine and ten, but perhaps once a week, thanks to some private whim of the engine driver, it leaves at half-past seven. Such things can be a little trying. In theory, I rather admire the Spaniards for not sharing our northern time neurosis, but unfortunately I share it myself. After endless rumours, manyanas and delays, we were suddenly ordered to the front at two hours' notice, when much of our equipment was still unissued. There were 
terrible tumults in the quartermaster's store. In the end, numbers of men had to leave without their full equipment. The barracks had promptly filled with women who seemed to have sprung up from the ground and were helping their menfolk to roll their blankets and pack their kit bags. It was rather humiliating that I had to be shown how to put on my new leather cartridge boxes by a Spanish girl, the wife of Williams, the other English militiaman. She was a gentle, dark-eyed, intensely feminine creature, who looked as though her life work was to rock a cradle, but who, as a matter of fact, had fought bravely in the street battles of July. At this time she was carrying a baby, which was born just ten months after the outbreak of war, and had perhaps been begotten behind a barricade. The train was due to leave at eight, and it was about ten past eight, when the harassed, sweating officers managed to marshal us in the barrack square. I remember very vividly the torchlit scene, the uproar and excitement, the red flags flapping in the torchlight, the massed ranks of militiamen with their knapsacks on their backs and their rolled blankets worn bandolier-wise across the shoulder, and the shouting and the clatter of boots and tin pannikins, and then a tremendous and finally successful hissing for silence, and then some political commissar standing beneath a huge rolling red banner and making us a speech in Catalan. Finally they marched us to the station, taking the longest route, three or four miles, so as to show us to the whole town. In the Ramblas they halted us while a borrowed band played some revolutionary tune or other. Once again the conquering hero stuff, shouting and enthusiasm, red flags and red and black flags everywhere, friendly crowds thronging the pavement to have a look at us, women waving from the windows. How natural it all seemed then. How remote and improbable now. The train was packed so tight with men that there was barely room even on the floor, let alone on the seats. At the last moment, Williams's wife came rushing down the platform and gave us a bottle of wine and a foot of that bright red sausage which tastes of soap and gives you diarrhoea. The train crawled out of Catalonia and on to the plateau of Aragon at the normal wartime speed of something under twenty kilometres an hour. Chapter 2 Barbastro, though a long way from the front line, looked bleak and chipped. Swarms of militiamen in shabby uniforms wandered up and down the streets, trying to keep warm. On a ruinous wall I came upon a poster dating from the previous year and announcing that six handsome bulls would be killed in the arena on such and such a date. How forlorn its faded colours looked. Where were the handsome bulls and the handsome bullfighters now? It appeared that even in Barcelona there were hardly any bullfights nowadays. For some reason all the best matadors were fascists. They sent my company by lorry to Sietamo, then westward to Alcibiere which was just behind the line fronting Zaragoza. Sietama had been fought over three times before the anarchists finally took it in October, and parts of it were smashed to pieces by shell fire, and most of the houses pockmarked by rifle bullets. We were fifteen hundred feet above sea level now. It was beastly cold, with dense mists that came swirling up from nowhere. Between Sietama and Alcibiere, the lorry driver lost his way, this was one of the regular features of the war, and we were wandering for hours in the mist. It was late at night when we reached Alcibiere. Somebody shepherded us through morasses of mud into a mule stable, where we dug ourselves down into the chaff and promptly fell asleep. Chaff is not bad to sleep in when it is clean, not so good as hay, but better than straw. It was only in the morning light that I discovered that the chaff was full of bread crusts, torn newspapers, bones, dead rats, and jagged milk tins. We were near the front line now, near enough to smell the characteristic smell of war. In my experience, the smell of excrement and decaying food. Alcibiere had never been shelled, and was in a better state than most of the villages immediately behind the line. Yet I believe that even in peacetime you could not travel in that part of Spain without being struck by the peculiar, squalid misery of the Aragonese villages. They are built like fortresses, a mass of mean little houses of mud and stone huddling round the church, and even in spring you see hardly a flower anywhere. The houses have no gardens, only backyards, where ragged fowls skate over the beds of mule dung.' 
It was vile weather, with alternate mist and rain. The narrow earth roads had been churned into a sea of mud in places two feet deep, through which the lorries struggled with racing wheels, and the peasants led their clumsy carts, which were pulled by strings of mules, sometimes as many as six in a string, always pulling tandem. The constant come and go of troops had reduced the village to a state of unspeakable filth. It did not possess, and never had possessed, such a thing as a lavatory or a drain of any kind, and there was not a square yard anywhere where you could tread without watching your step. The church had long been used as a latrine, so had all the fields for a quarter of a mile round. I never think of my first two months at war without thinking of wintry stubble fields whose edges are crusted with dung. Two days passed, and no rifles were issued to us. When you had been to the Comité de Guerre and inspected the row of holes in the wall, holes made by rifle volleys, various fascists having been executed there, you had seen all the sights that Alcibiere contained. Up in the front line, things were obviously quiet, very few wounded were coming in. The chief excitement was the arrival of fascist deserters, who were brought under guard from the front line. Many of the troops opposite us on this part of the line were not fascists at all, merely wretched conscripts who had been doing their military service at the time when war broke out, and were only too anxious to escape. Occasionally small batches of them took the risk of slipping across to our lines. No doubt more would have done so if their relatives had not been in fascist territory. These deserters were the first real fascists I had ever seen. It struck me that they were indistinguishable from ourselves, except that they wore khaki overalls. They were always ravenously hungry when they arrived, natural enough after a day or two of dodging about in no man's land, but it was always triumphantly pointed to as a proof that the fascist troops were starving. I watched one of them being fed in a peasant's house. It was somehow rather a pitiful sight. A tall boy of twenty, deeply wind-burnt, with his clothes in rags, crouched over the fire, shoveling a pannikin full of stew into himself at desperate speed, and all the while his eyes flitted nervously round the ring of militiamen who stood watching him. I think he still half believed that we were bloodthirsty reds and were going to shoot him as soon as he had finished his meal. The armed man who guarded him kept stroking his shoulder and making reassuring noises. On one memorable day, fifteen deserters arrived in a single batch, they were led through the village in triumph, with a man riding in front of them on a white horse. I managed to take a rather blurry photograph, which was stolen from me later. On our third morning in Alcibiere, the rifles arrived. A sergeant with a coarse, dark yellow face was handing them out in the mule stable. I got a shock of dismay when I saw the thing they gave me. It was a German Mauser, dated 1896, more than forty years old. It was rusty, the bolt was stiff, the wooden barrel guard was split. One glance down the muzzle showed that it was corroded and past praying for. Most of the rifles were equally bad, some of them even worse, and no attempt was made to give the best weapons to the men who knew how to use them. The best rifle of the lot, only ten years old, was given to a half-witted little beast of fifteen, known to everyone as the Maricon, Nancy boy. The sergeant gave us five minutes instruction which consisted in explaining how you loaded a rifle and how you took the boat to pieces. Many of the militiamen had never had a gun in their hands before, and very few, I imagine, knew what the sights were for. Cartridges were handed out, fifty to a man, and then the ranks were formed, and we strapped our kits on our backs and set out for the front line, about three miles away. The centuria, eighty men and several dogs, wound raggedly up the road. Every militia column had at least one dog attached to it as a mascot. One wretched brute that marched with us had had P.O.U.M. branded on it in huge letters, and slunk along as though conscious that there was something wrong with its appearance. At the head of the column, beside the red flag, Georges Kopp, the stout Belgian commandante, was riding a black horse. A little way ahead, a youth from the brigand-like militia cavalry pranced to and fro, galloping up every piece of rising ground and posing himself in picturesque attitudes at the summit. The splendid horses of the Spanish cavalry had been captured in large numbers during the revolution and handed over to the militia, who, of course, were busy riding them to death. 
The road wound between yellow, infertile fields, untouched since last year's harvest. Ahead of us was the low sierra that lies between Alcibiade and Zaragoza. We were getting near the front line now, near the bombs, the machine guns and the mud. In secret, I was frightened. I knew the line was quiet at present. But unlike most of the men about me, I was old enough to remember the Great War, though not old enough to have fought in it. War, to me, meant roaring projectiles and skipping shards of steel. Above all, it meant mud, lice, hunger and cold. It is curious, but I dreaded the cold much more than I dreaded the enemy. The thought of it had been haunting me all the time I was in Barcelona. I had even lain awake at nights thinking of the cold in the trenches, the stand-tos in the grisly dawns, the long hours on sentry go with a frosted rifle, the icy mud that would slop over my boot tops. I admit, too, that I felt a kind of horror as I looked at the people I was marching among. You cannot possibly conceive what a rabble we looked. We straggled along with far less cohesion than a flock of sheep. Before we had gone two miles, the rear of the column was out of sight, and quite half of the so-called men were children, but I mean literally children, of sixteen years old at the very most. Yet they were all happy and excited at the prospect of getting to the front at last. As we neared the line, the boys round the red flag in front began to utter shouts of Visca P.O.U.M., Fascistas maricones, and so forth, shouts which were meant to be warlike and menacing, but which, from those childish throats, sounded as pathetic as the cries of kittens. It seemed dreadful that the defenders of the Republic should be this mob of ragged children, carrying worn-out rifles which they did not know how to use. I remember wondering what would happen if a fascist aeroplane passed our way, whether the airman would even bother to dive down and give us a burst from his machine gun. Surely even from the air he could see that we were not real soldiers. As the road struck into the Sierra, we branched off to the right and climbed a narrow mule track that wound round the mountainside. The hills in that part of Spain are of a queer formation, horseshoe-shaped with flattish tops and very steep sides running down into immense ravines. On the higher slopes nothing grows except stunted shrubs and heath, with the white bones of the limestone sticking out everywhere. The front line here was not a continuous line of trenches, which would have been impossible in such mountainous country. It was simply a chain of fortified posts, always known as positions, perched on each hilltop. In the distance you could see our position, at the crown of the horseshoe, a ragged barricade of sandbags, a red flag fluttering, the smoke of dugout fires. A little nearer, and you could smell a sickening, sweetish stink that lived in my nostrils for weeks afterwards. Into the cleft immediately behind the position, all the refuse of months had been tipped, a deep, festering bed of bread crusts, excrement, and rusty tins. The company we were relieving were getting their kits together. They had been three months in the line. Their uniforms were caked with mud, their boots falling to pieces, their faces mostly bearded. The captain commanding the position, Levinsky by name, but known to everyone as Benjamin, and by birth a Polish Jew, but speaking French as his native language, crawled out of his dugout and greeted us. He was a short youth of about twenty-five, with stiff black hair and a pale, eager face, which at this period of the war was always very dirty. A few stray bullets were cracking high overhead. The position was a semicircular enclosure at about fifty yards across, with a parapet that was partly sandbags and partly lumps of limestone. There were thirty or forty dugouts running into the ground like rat holes. Williams, myself, and Williams's Spanish brother-in-law made a swift dive for the nearest unoccupied dugout that looked habitable. Somewhere in front an occasional rifle banged, making queer rolling echoes among the stony hills. We had just dumped our kits and were crawling out of the dugout, when there was another bang, and one of the children of our company rushed back from the parapet with his face pouring blood. He had fired his rifle and had somehow managed to blow out the bolt. His scalp was torn to ribbons by the splinters of the burst cartridge case. It was our first casualty, and characteristically self-inflicted. In the afternoon we did our first guard, and Benjamin showed us round the position.' 
In front of the parapet there ran a system of narrow trenches hewn out of the rock, with extremely primitive loopholes made of piles of limestone. There were twelve sentries, placed at various points in the trench and behind the inner parapet. In front of the trench was the barbed wire, and then the hillside slid down into a seemingly bottomless ravine. Opposite were naked hills, in places mere cliffs of rock, all grey and wintry, with no life anywhere, not even a bird. I peered cautiously through a loophole, trying to find the fascist trench. 